Have you ever felt like you were walking through the valley of the shadow of death? Overwhelmed by life's challenges and wondered where God is in those moments? Do you truly understand what it means for the Lord to be your shepherd and what responsibilities and privileges come with it? Today, I urge you to join me as we explore some profound truths from Psalm 23 that will not only help you to start your day right, but also give you a revelation and profound insight into God's Word. I am also going to pray a powerful prayer with you in the mighty name of Jesus. So watch until the end and open your hearts to receive the blessings of this prayer. My dear friends, let us embark on a life-changing journey through one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible, Psalm 23. Through this, we seek to uncover how these ancient verses can breathe new life into our modern situations. In the book of Isaiah 40, verse 8, the scripture says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Indeed, the eternal truths found in Psalm 23 are as relevant today as they were thousands of years ago. We will explore the six profound verses of this psalm, unlocking its treasures and applying its truths to our lives. Each verse serves as a guiding light, offering comfort, security, and motivation. In exploring this passage, we'll uncover the wonderful layers of its meanings, transforming the way we start our day and live our lives. Psalm 23 verse 1 tells us, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My friends, we can see that the first verse of Psalm 23 begins with a declaration of divine guardianship. Close your eyes and say this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let these words soak deep into your spirit. Verse 1 of this psalm isn't just poetic imagery. It's a truth we can anchor our lives on. My friends, think about this for a moment. What do shepherds do? A shepherd's primary role is to guide, protect, and provide for his flock. So when David wrote these words, he spoke from experience. He was a shepherd before he was a king. Now, just as David cared for his flock, he understood that God cared for him. The account of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17 shows us how God protected David when he faced enormous challenges, just like a shepherd would. Being in the care of the Good Shepherd means we have an abundance of grace, provision, and love. Our role is to follow him. Jesus told us in John 10 verses 14 to 15, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so, I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. By recognizing Jesus as our shepherd, we acknowledge his sacrifice and the eternal life it grants us. And my friends, let me just pause to share something that I have never shared with you before. I feel compelled to share a personal testimony with you that is very dear to my heart. The message of Psalm 23 has deeply touched my soul, and I will tell you why. Our YouTube channel, Daily Jesus Devotional, wasn't created out of a desire to follow others or for material gain. In 2022, I had an interesting dream. And in that dream, my wife and I received a divine directive to feed the sheep. To be honest, while I was in the dream, I was a bit disappointed that a heavenly being assigned us to feed the sheep. Upon awaking from the dream, it became clear that feeding the sheep was not a demeaning assignment, but rather a call to bring the word of God to the sheep it was an assignment to nourish souls, to feed God's people with his word. Then both of us had some follow-up dreams. 
In particular, one of these dreams revealed our anointing to also pray for countless people. And even more interestingly, the people who we prayed for would get very good results. We are not even sure how God worked it all out so that we could have brought a team together to accomplish this divine mandate that God has given us. Next thing we know, we are here on YouTube ministering to you all and sharing the word of God with masses of people, feeding the sheep just as we were instructed. It still amazes us how everything was divinely aligned. We are thrilled to be here sharing with you, and we thank you for being a part of this journey. To God be all the glory. Great things he hath done. Now, my friends, there are times when we stray or get distracted by the cares of this world. The parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15 demonstrates God's relentless pursuit of us, even when we stray. It leaves the 99 to seek the one that is lost, emphasizing the inherent worth he sees in each of us. And isn't it comforting to know that when we make God our shepherd, our wants are addressed even before they arise. This isn't to say that life will be free of challenges. However, God's provision can manifest in unexpected ways, sometimes bringing solutions even before problems occur. Consider the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings 17. Despite famine in the land, God's provision was evident in their lives, turning scarcity into abundance. This promise doesn't just cover material needs, but extends to emotional and spiritual aspects. Take the case of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. She was barren and deeply distressed, Yet when she poured out her soul to God, her emotional and spiritual emptiness was filled. She later became the mother of Samuel, one of Israel's greatest prophets. So, my friends, as you go about your day, remember this. Making the Lord your shepherd isn't merely a statement of faith. It's a lifestyle of surrender and trust, knowing that he has your best interests at heart. Let's move on to the serenity and provision captured in the second verse. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Green pastures and still waters represent places of comfort, nourishment, and peace. In our fast-paced world, stress and challenges seem ever-present. Yet God promises us places of rest if we follow him. God wants us to experience moments of rest and spiritual nourishment. In Exodus 16, when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, God provided manna from heaven. This was physical sustenance, yes, but also a lesson in reliance on God. Notice that they couldn't store the manna for future use. They had to trust God to provide for them each day. Like the Israelites, God provides manna in our lives. Sometimes it's a word of encouragement when we're down, or other times it may be unexpected help when we're in need. Have you ever felt like you're always in a rush and can't find time for God? This verse reminds us that God himself makes us lie down in green pastures. Sometimes God will orchestrate circumstances to slow us down and make us take that much needed rest to reconnect with him or with others. Think about Jonah, the runaway prophet who was swallowed by a big fish. Jonah 1 captures this intriguing story. While in the belly of the fish, Jonah had no choice but to slow down and reflect on his relationship with God. And what about similar situations in our lives? Think about this. A surprise job loss can lead us to rediscover passions and spend quality time with family. No one wishes for health issues, but when they do occur, they force a pause in our busy lives. An unexpected injury might provide an opportunity to appreciate health, strengthen family ties, or witness God's healing miracles. Or a power outage 
can turn into an evening of having candlelit chats, playing board games, or stargazing with loved ones. Verse 2 also makes reference to still waters, which also signifies emotional peace. Jesus calmed the storm in Mark 4, verses 37 to 39, demonstrating his authority over natural and metaphorical or symbolic storms in our lives. Still waters are only possible when we let Jesus take control of our lives, calming the storms that unsettle us. The act of being led beside still waters also implies guidance. When the Israelites left Egypt, God didn't abandon them. He led them through a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, as recorded in Exodus 13 verses 21 to 22. He gave them direction. Similarly, God promises to guide us when we let him lead. Being led beside still waters means you're on a path of righteousness and peace. It doesn't mean you won't face troubles, but you'll have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Let's remember when Peter walked on water in Matthew 14, verses 28 to 31. Despite the storm, his focus on Jesus made the impossible possible. So, as you face the chaos and challenges of life, seek those green pastures and still waters that only God our Good Shepherd can provide. Each day, make room for Him to lead you, guide you, and bring rest to your soul. Moving forward, we come to a place of restoration and guidance in verse 3 of Psalm 23, which reads, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. In our lives, we face numerous challenges that can weigh down our souls. Perhaps, like Job, you've lost something or someone dear to you. Maybe, like the prodigal son in Luke 15 verses 11 to 24, you've gone astray and you are seeking God for restoration. Here, God assures us that He can restore our souls. God's restoration is comprehensive. It's not just about getting back what was lost. It's about being made whole again. The account of Naaman in 2 Kings 5 presents a vivid picture of such restoration. Naaman was a powerful Syrian army commander, but he was also a leper. A simple act of obedience to God's instruction through the prophet Elisha led not just to his healing, but also to his acknowledgement of the true God. His soul was restored on multiple levels. God also promises to lead us in paths of righteousness. Remember Daniel, a man of integrity who was thrown into a lion's den for his steadfast faith. Daniel 6 tells his story, yet even there, God preserved him. Daniel was led on a path of righteousness, not because he was perfect, but because he was committed to doing God's will. However, Note the phrase which says, for his name's sake. God leads us not for our glory, but for his. The Israelites' escape from Egypt in Exodus 14 illustrates this. God gained glory when he parted the Red Sea and led his people to safety. Pharaoh's pursuing army, seeing this great act, recognized the power of God. Now, being led in paths of righteousness also comes with challenges. Consider Joseph, who was sold into slavery and unjustly imprisoned, as recorded in Genesis 37 to 50. Despite these hardships, Joseph remained faithful, and eventually his faithfulness, which translates to righteousness, led to his promotion. This path was not for Joseph's sake, but for the fulfillment of God's plan and for his name's sake. If you ever feel like you're losing your way, remember this verse. Not only does God promise to restore your soul, but He also assures you that He will lead you in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Trust in Him.
to set your path straight. Just like he did for Ruth, a Moabite widow who chose the path of righteousness and became an ancestor of Jesus Christ. My friends, as we delve into the fourth verse of Psalm 23, it tells us, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Notice the phrase shadow of death. We all know that shadows can be frightening, but they are not a living thing. The shadow of death is therefore a realm that could signal danger, but doesn't have to signify the end. Let's consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel 3. They were literally thrown into a fiery furnace, a valley of the shadow of death, if ever there was one. Yet, they emerged unharmed. They could walk through it because they knew who walked with them. God's rod and staff signify discipline and guidance. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 6 tells us, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves he chastens. It might seem contradictory to say that discipline is comforting, but in this case, it is. It shows that God cares enough to correct us, ensuring we walk in the right path. The staff, often used for support and to guide sheep, signifies the supportive role of God in our lives. God not only corrects us, but also supports us. He's our rock, our foundation. We see this in the life of Apostle Paul, who endured various hardships, including shipwrecks, beatings, and imprisonment. Despite his trials, Paul found comfort in God's guidance and presence, declaring in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's interesting that David speaks of comfort coming from the rod and staff. These are instruments used in the process of guiding and correcting. They are not objects that we typically associate with comfort. However, their comfort lies in the security they offer. Remember the story of Esther who risked her life to save her people. Esther 4, verse 16, captures her decision to act despite the potential cost or risk. Yet, she drew comfort from the guidance and discipline that she received from her cousin Mordecai and from the God she served. My friends, comfort doesn't always come from avoiding problems or escaping challenges. Sometimes, Comfort comes from knowing you're walking in obedience to God's will, even when it leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. Like Joshua, who led Israel into numerous battles to claim the promised land, we must walk fearlessly, assured that God's rod and staff will guide and protect us. Continuing on, my dear friends. Verse 5 of Psalm 23 conveys a powerful message and it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. This verse shifts from the imagery of a shepherd to that of a gracious provider, emphasizing the Lord's constant provision and protection. The idea of preparing a table suggests deliberate intention. God doesn't just throw things together. He prepares. We see this intentionality in the story of Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 18. Despite their old age, God had prepared a future that included a son, Isaac. Even when it seemed biologically impossible, God had prepared a table of blessings for them that even their circumstances couldn't hinder. A table in the presence of enemies is a paradox or ironic contradiction. It implies that even in difficult situations, God's blessings upon you are unceasing. This brings to mind the story of Nehemiah, who was tasked with rebuilding Jerusalem's walls in the face of opposition. His enemies tried to distract and intimidate him, 
yet he remained focused. Nehemiah 6 verse 3 captures his response. He said, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Like Nehemiah, God prepares a table for us that no enemy can overturn. Being anointed with oil is an indication of divine selection and empowerment. We see where David himself was anointed by Samuel. In 1 Samuel 16, marking him as chosen by God for a purpose. When God anoints you, it's a signal to both the earthly and spiritual realms that you are under divine authority. My cup runs over signifies abundance. God doesn't give sparingly, he gives generously. The story of the widow's oil in 2 Kings chapter 4 illustrates this. Elisha told her to gather empty jars, and her small jar of oil miraculously filled all of them. Her cup didn't just fill, it ran over. So, whatever you're going through, whether it feels like you're surrounded by enemies or walking alone, remember that God has prepared a table for you, anointed you, and filled your cup to the point of overflow. These aren't just encouraging words. They are your divine heritage. The Lord will bless you abundantly, to the point that even your enemies won't be able to remain silent. And verse 6 tells us, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The idea that goodness and mercy will follow us paints a vivid picture. This verse always brings so much comfort to my soul, and I hope it does the same for you. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, is reminding us that God's relentless love pursues us throughout our journey. Remember the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus sought him out, and as a result, goodness and mercy not only followed, but overtook him. Luke 19 verses 9 to 10 says, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Just as Zacchaeus experienced a life-changing encounter with Jesus, we too can find redemption and grace when we open our hearts to him. To dwell in the house of the Lord forever is not just a future hope, but a present reality. Stephen, while being stoned, saw the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Even in his last moments, he was dwelling in the presence of the Lord. This last verse is a summary of a life lived under divine guidance, like Noah who found favor in the eyes of the Lord and was preserved through the flood. A life led by God is characterized by goodness and mercy. Now listen to this. God's goodness and mercy is not dependent on our actions, but His goodness shines brightest when we recognize Him for who He truly is. And when we seek repentance and forgiveness and strive to lead a righteous life, Think of the thief on the cross, who even in his final moments, with no time left to rectify the mistakes of his past or live out a lengthy life of righteousness, he recognized Jesus for who he truly is. In Luke 23, verse 42, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In uttering these words, the thief on the cross demonstrated profound recognition of Christ's divinity and sovereignty. The term Lord is not used lightly. It's a title reserved for one with authority, power, and dominion. By addressing Jesus as Lord, the thief was acknowledging him as the supreme ruler, master, and possessor of all. Furthermore, the reference to your kingdom signifies an acknowledgement of Jesus' eternal reign and dominion. 
So the thief didn't just see Jesus as a mere man hanging beside him. He saw the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In his brief, heartfelt plea, he captured a profound understanding and acknowledgement of who Jesus truly is. Even in the direst of circumstances, he recognized the sovereignty and majesty of Christ. By acknowledging Christ's divinity and seeking mercy, he was granted the promise of paradise. This wasn't due to his actions throughout his life, but rather his genuine moment of repentance and faith at the very end. It showcases that as long as you still have the breath of life, it's never too late to turn to God, to acknowledge His true nature, and to receive His boundless mercy. So, the thief on the cross experienced the goodness and mercy of God, and was assured a place in paradise. And my friends, this is a reminder for all of us, as promised in 1 John 1 verse 9, which says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful, and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This last verse also mentions dwelling in the house of the Lord forever, which captures the eternal perspective that we should have. It brings to mind the words of Jesus in John 14 verse 2, which says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. My dear friends, Psalm 23 isn't just a collection of uplifting verses. It is a profound revelation of God's character and His relationship with us. It is a guide for life, a beacon for the lost, a comfort for the troubled, and a hope for the hopeless. Let us embrace these divine truths of Psalm 23. Now, to all those within the sound of my voice, let us go to the Lord in prayer. I want you to pray this prayer with me so that you can have all the blessings of this prayer. Let us pray to our gracious and merciful God, Heavenly Father, the God of all creation. You are the Good Shepherd, our provider, our protector, and our eternal hope. I exalt your holy name. Lord, I confess my sins before you and ask for your forgiveness. I also release forgiveness toward all those who have wronged me. I let go of all resentment and bitterness that I may walk freely in your grace. Lord, you are my shepherd, and I declare that I shall not want. I am grateful that you are my Jehovah Jireh, and you provide for me in abundance. Above all, that I ask or think. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every spirit of lack, every force of hindrance and stagnation, and every shadow of doubt and fear that tries to attack my life. Lead me, O oh God, to green pastures where my soul may be nourished, and to still waters where I will find peace. Mighty God, let your rod and your staff comfort me, guiding me through the valleys and shadowy places of life. I bind every attack of the enemy, and I claim victory over every form of evil that seeks to derail my path in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for an increase in faith, hope, love, and in every good thing that you have planned for my life. May my cup overflow with your blessings, enriching the lives of others and for the glory of your kingdom. Jehovah, Rapha, I declare healing upon every cell every tissue and marrow, every organ and muscle, every bone and joint, and every system in my body. I declare that my body and mind will be in harmony with your divine promises of health, peace, and vitality. Protect me and my loved ones, dear Lord, with your mighty hand. 
shield us from the arrows that fly by day and the pestilence that walks in the darkness. May we all experience your amazing grace, provisions, and love. Lord, as I say this prayer together with everyone listening, I thank you for every heart that is humbled before you right now. We join together in this prayer as we claim the promises of Psalm 23. We lift our voices to you, seeking your guidance as our shepherd and Lord. We thank you for leading us to places of comfort, nourishment, and peace. Father God, we pray for the restoration of our souls and for paths of righteousness that magnify your holy name. Lord, in unity, we bind every spirit of illness, confusion, worry, depression, addiction, and despair that may seek to plague us. We claim victory over them in the mighty name of Jesus. Shelter us, Heavenly Father, in our comings and goings and as we walk through valleys and mountains. Merciful Father, may you take us from a place of lack to a place overflowing with abundance and from a season of want to a lifetime of your bountiful provision. Lord, prepare a feast of blessings before us, even in the presence of our enemies. Your goodness is running after us. We declare that your goodness and mercy will chase us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in your house forever. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering my prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you were blessed by this message, type the word Amen in the comments section below. I declare that all the blessings of this prayer are now upon you in the name of Jesus. You can help us to reach more persons and spread the gospel. You can do this by sharing the video with a friend or family member who you know needs the blessing of this prayer and by clicking the like button. Also remember to subscribe to our daily Jesus devotional channel for more videos that will bless your heart and uplift your spirit. We appreciate all those who support us. You're blessed to be a blessing. Now, for those who are listening and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I urge you to receive God's grace with an open and repentant heart. Start where you are. Your past doesn't matter. Jesus came to seek and to save those that are lost. God loves you. It is not God's will that anyone should perish, but for all to come to repentance. Say this simple salvation prayer for yourself. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, hear my prayer, I pray. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Now that you have prayed this prayer, you can ask a pastor to baptize you at a local church and make that decision public. Baptism is a symbol of that decision to follow Jesus. I then encourage you to have fellowship with other believers, to learn more about your new life, and to get to know more about God. Please feel free to leave your prayer request in the comment section so that we can present them before God for your blessings and victory. Also, we invite other believers on the YouTube platform and all over the world to join us and start praying for you right now. And we want you to know that even if you don't see a reply to your prayer request, it doesn't mean that you were not prayed for. Rest assured that we are actively lifting up each request to God that is in accordance with His will. 
We believe in the power of prayer to bring comfort, healing, and guidance in accordance with God's perfect plan. To God be all the glory. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.